Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the JCO article, Improving Breast Cancer Surgical Treatment Decision-Making, the I Can Decide Randomized Clinical Trial by Holly et al. My name is Brian Eggleston, and I'm an Associate Research Professor at the Fox Chase Cancer Center, which is part of the Temple University Health System in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My oncologic specialty is biostatistics. In this trial, Holly and colleagues report on the I Can Decide interactive tool that can assist patients with decisions regarding local regional breast cancer treatment. Participants in the study were randomized either to the I Can Decide website or a control website, which they term static. The authors found that those who used the website were more likely to have high-quality decisions and report better decision preparation than those who used the control site. While the study findings seem promising, as a biostatistician, I would like to provide some commentary on the role that the trial protocol played in the design and analyses of the study. First, some history. For quite some time, there has been concern in the oncologic community that too many Phase three trials are failing. There are many reasons why this could happen such as studies with sample sizes that are too small, or results from phase two trials that are overly optimistic. At the same time, there is increasing concern about the reproducibility of research, with such concerns reported in both scientific journals such as Nature and the popular press, such as The Economist magazine. One attempt to deal with many of these problems is to require clinical trials to pre-register study designs, including primary outcomes before accruing participants. A popular public registration site is clinicaltrials.gov. Increasingly, journals and federal agencies are requiring pre-registration of trials. The thinking is, if primary outcomes are pre-registered, it will be more difficult for investigators to claim study success by cherry-picking outcomes with the highest statistical significance. If investigators examine multiple outcomes and then report the most significant findings to demonstrate treatment efficacy, this can lead to false positive results. Heuristically, we often set the p-value for declaring statistical significance and study success as 5%. This means, on average over all studies, that only 5% of treatment effects will be statistically significant when there are no true treatment effects. In other words, only 5% of examined outcomes will generally contain false positive findings. One can quickly calculate from the 5% rule that if investigators examine over 20 different outcomes in a study, then on average, most trials would have at least one false positive result and could declare their treatment effective based on a spurious finding in one of the over 20 outcomes examined. Pre-registration of the primary outcome or outcomes was designed to reduce the possibility that treatments would be declared effective based on spurious findings. By pre-registering a small number of outcomes, it is less likely that individual trials on average would have false positive findings. We can still assume that 5% of trials might contain false positive findings, but still, 5% is a much lower rate than the majority of trials containing false positive findings, as might happen if investigators were allowed to selectively report only significant findings. So this brings us back to the study by Holly and colleagues. It is unclear whether the authors ever properly pre-registered their primary outcomes for this trial. First, in section 5.5 of the protocol, the authors state that a high-quality decision is one that is informed and preference concordant. For the informed component of this measure, the authors state that they will adapt a 12-question measure related to knowledge about local therapy developed by Lee and colleagues. However, the final adaptation did not seem to be specified in the protocol or on clinicaltrials.gov. In addition, there is some discrepancy in the protocol as to how high-quality decisions will be evaluated. In the analytics section of the protocol, the investigators state that they will examine knowledge and concordant decisions separately. In the JCO paper, the knowledge and preference concordant decisions are combined into a single measure. 
examination of the registered trial on clinicaltrials.gov also provides some ambiguity as to the actual primary outcome. Further, if one examines the archived history of the trial registration on clinicaltrials.gov, it seems that some details of the trial may have been registered after the trial opened, which may be viewed as problematic. The primary analytic methods in the protocol are also vague and allow for multiple types of tests to be applied to determine statistical significance. There did not seem to be a single statistical test specified that would be used to declare statistical significance and ultimately success for the primary study aim. Hence, the results of the paper should be viewed in context that the primary outcomes and analytic methods may not have been sufficiently pre-specified or pre-registered, which can increase the chance of false positive results. In summary, when reading the results of any trial, it is worthwhile to also read the protocol that is simultaneously published with the trial to gain context into the validity of the findings. When examining protocols, it is advisable to read the original protocol, amendments, and clinicaltrials.gov registration. In Holly and Colley's case, the authors did publish a protocol document in a peer-reviewed journal, but this was ultimately published in 2017, well after the trial opened. It is best to read the original protocol and amendments as approved by an institutional review board or scientific review committee prior to the trial opening. Over time, pre-specification of primary outcomes and distinct primary analyses and protocols, as well as the registration of protocols prior to accruing participants, enhances rigor and reproducibility by reducing the possibility of spurious clinical trial findings. This concludes this JCO podcast. Thank you for listening.
For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.